Okay, moving on to R1. Receive a presentation from Stephen Umfleet, data and analysis expert on two items related to the March 5th, 2024 primary election. Potential issues related to the time changes shown on the audit logs and inconsistencies between the number of ballots written to V drives, drives and the number of ballots reported in the final tally. So welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. So I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry. Yeah, we're not going to. Sorry. Yeah. I'm having trouble hearing you. should do it. Okay. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, master's in computer engineering. I've done work with database management systems, DNA sequencers, biometrics, fraud prevention and detection, and machine learning. For three years now, I've studied local, state, and federal election systems and processes and laws and records. I'm a physical scientist and an information scientist, minus the PhD. I have reviewed or studied election records from over 20 counties in California and from at least a dozen states. I've developed software to translate heart cast vote records from uh, thousands of XML files into um, text-based uh, spreadsheet files. I've developed software to aid in analysis of voter rolls, and I'm on my own county's election operations advisory council. So I'm glad to be here because Shasta County is a beacon of hope to the rest of California because of your willingness to consider evidence and to decouple your elections from centralized state control. If I were a local resident, seeing what I have seen in your election records, I would be concerned about my vote. I bring these issues to this council to inform you of these and hopefully to obtain some explanations so that we all learn. If there's a legitimate explanation to my observations, I, am, I would find that very comforting. So I'll first go over some definitions and we'll talk about the unaccounted V-Drive then we'll go into the timestamps and clock updates. So cast vote record, it's a, a record of choices made on a ballot or the aggregate of such records in one election. And most people who um, I work with uh, talk about the aggregate, so that's what we'll talk about here. It's not a single record for our purposes. A V drive is a USB or thumb drive used to transfer results from a tabulator or workstation to the election management system to preserve the air gap uh, isolation. So air gap, is physical device isolation for those who are concerned about cybersecurity. We've uh, long known that uh, a system, a, an electronic system that is connected to the internet or connected remotely can uh, be, uh, there can be cyber intrusion. It's, uh, it's a pretty much a matter of uh, expectation. So we talk about an air gap, that's air gapped, but I have um, cellular connection, I can connect to a cell tower or I can get um, input from a cell tower. I also have Wi-Fi, I also have Bluetooth, and maybe even near-field communications. So um, there have been many cases where, uh, shown, demonstrated nationwide where um, there have been um, recorded, documented intrusion from external sources into our election systems. Not ours, it's in this county, but uh, nationwide. So the next uh, slide, you'll see the, the diagram. This is a, a so you have the four workstations that are connected to scanners, and those are all connected to a central computer server, which is uh, very uh, central. Um, that, is, that unit is supposed to be the air-gapped unit, so that's supposed to be isolated from external intrusion. But we have, so that's why we have the thumb drive communication. So thumb drives, the V drives, are used to transmit the ballot counts to the Verity count. So they are all summed up there, and then you ha have your um, cast vote record computed. The central server is where we, it's the system that creates the audit log. So it gets inputs from all four workstations as to decide what goes into the audit log. Definitions. So the audit log is the who, what, when, and how, and where record of events occurring during an election. It's useful to validate the apparent sequence of events and most of that will be a scanning, adjudication, batch creation, deletion, or whatever. You also have the audit log is supposed to be able to recreate, from examination of the audit log, you should be able to recreate what happened, um, the, the events that happened in the course of, uh, of the election for this uh, unit of workstations that we're talking about. We have UTC, which is Coordinated Universal Time, 
And that the example there shows the date of March 4th, 2024. And then you have a, a T, which, is that, which, uh, which is followed by the timestamp. So it's local time, then the UTC offset. So since our um, standard time here is eight hours behind universal time, you will see the, the minus 08 at the end of that timestamp. And once you switch to daylight savings time, then it goes to minus 07. And so um, we'll also talk about the, so in the, in the audit log, when, a, when there's a clock adjustment made to the system, you will find uh, the original time listed and the destination time listed so that you know what time did the system think it was when the clock change was made and what time did it adjust to. So then in the next slide, you'll see universal coordinate detonated time, the, the diagram here. So that just uh, should make it easier to, to, to comprehend. So it's March to October or November in this case. So you will see the standard time is the minus 0 0.8 offset from universal time. And the daylight savings time is minus 0 0.7 hours. So now the audit log, it contains records from, pre, one, the one that I examined, contains records from pre-election testing. This is like the logic and accuracy test and maybe some other stuff through the final ballot processing prior to certification. So we have uh, around 375,000 events recorded in the audit log. Makes for a long study if you're looking at a paper copy of, of this file. About 197,000 entries are pre-election events and about 178,000 are election related. From the copy that I had, the operator or user ID was redacted. So then if you go on to the audit log format, you will see the row column, which is, um, it looks like it's supposed to be the, um, the order in which the entries were made to the, the audit log. But in, in all that I could see from your audit log, it matched the, it was like sorted by the timestamp. So, and that's part of where the, some of the confusion comes later on, but we'll talk about that. So after the row, you see the log date time entry, which is the UTC format. Then you see the device ID. We have the four workstations. They have very similar device IDs ending in 706, 606, 806, and 906. Then you have tags. So for someone looking at the audit log for certain types of information, you would see the, the system module where the um, audit event has occurred. Then you see the event description. It might be task opened, view loaded, batch created, batch deleted, things like that. And you have a description in the event data. So that tells you um, the specifics of like, what batch it might have been, uh, what ballot number it might have been, and other matters of uh, specific interest to that event. So now we'll go to the V drive about the uncounted ballots. So it is my expectation when I see a V drive written to by Verity Central that it will um, end up in Verity Count. Um, there, there may be some condition under which it is not that case, but I fully expect anything written to vDrive to end up in the official results. So we have 100 ballots written to vDrive that do not appear in the CAS vote record. For that vDrive, those were the, that was the entire uh, amount of ballots written to the vDrive. So it's not like there was a uh, selection of certain ballots from the vDrive that were counted or not counted. We have the entire vDrive results are not included in the official results. 11 of the 12 vDrives did contribute to everything that is in the official tally. So why was one drive excluded? Who decided this? Was it prepared for a special purpose but deemed unnecessary? So we could have legitimate reasons, it could be an oversight, or there could be something else. So now, let's look at, um, we have the next uh, slide, um, shows the specific V drives here. So you see, um, there are two, two, um, two uh, events here highlighted, because two, two um, are, are curious in themselves. The one on row 372978, that is the, the, the 10th V drive write that occurred shows a batch one with total ballots 100, and it tells you which workstation it was D706, and that's the one that never shows up anywhere else. For the other one, you see um, line uh, row 347, 121. That's about the sixth row down, I think, 
Yes. So you look at the timestamp on that one, and it, is, it shows uh, March 13th at 1.56 a.m., and then you have a total of 9,147 ballots written to that V drive. So um, if that timestamp is correct and there was no one there doing it, then where did these ballots come from? So that's a good question. Um, if the time was incorrect, then um, we were off by quite a bit. So that would, that would also be a concern. Why, do we, why were we off by that much? So the V-Drive ballots written, um, you have a summary of the total ballots written, um, 55,069 ballots. If you added all those ballots up from the previous slide, it shows you um, uh, all the ballots written. And so 55,069 written to V-Drive, 54,969 in the official tally and in the CVR. So if you um, ask your ROV, you should be, she should be able to show you how the application enables clock adjustment. I think it would be interesting to go up to the very central and say, how does this, how does this happen? How, did you, how do you change the time from this application? It would be educational. You probably have a date uh, ability to set. You have a time, an AM and PM. You have a time zone, maybe Pacific, Mountain, whatever. And you have a, maybe a daylight savings time flag or something. That would be interesting to know. So how does a clock adjustment affect audit log entries and timestamps? Well, it turns out that the timestamp gets the, is, is corresponds to the destination time on the adjustment. So the original time, if it was now um, 3 o'clock, and then we set it to 2 o'clock, an hour back, what you'll find in the timestamp for that event is the 2 o'clock. So the question then is, did it occur at 3 o'clock or 2 o'clock or some other time? Am I going too fast or anything? No. A little bit. Okay. <laughs> I'll go a little bit slower then. All right. So clock adjustment and the audit log. So the audit log is the authority when it comes to sequence and detail of events. If you want to recreate what happened in this portion of the election, you should be able to go to the audit log and go line by line and have confidence that this is what happened. If someone else says something different happened, then this should be the, the proof that something that, that, that is... Um, that there's, there's a conflict in, in information. So this allows a reviewer to verify that what is said to have happened actually did happen. An intruder seeking to cover his tracks, and I'm speaking specifically of a cyber attack here, might wish to compromise the audit log. And so um, there would be various ways to do that, and there are, of course, various uh, ways to prevent that from happening, but the question is, are those methods of prevention adequate? So an unusable audit log. So if you can't use this audit log to recreate the events that happened on those workstations and on the Verity Central, then it's like a loss of control of your election system. <coughs> so now we do have some corrupted logs. As I was speaking of uh, earlier, you have the possibility of a, an intruder might wish to tamper with the logs. Um, the date stamps on these corrupted log entries all occur um, just before or on um, March 5th. So, and that would be, I think, before the official counting started. So, um, these, maybe it's okay that this, these logs were corrupted, maybe it's not. Um, especially if the timestamps time of these corrupted log entries were actually themselves changed somehow. So, I've seen similar errors, or like the corrupted logs, in another county, and it was not paired with uh, the unusual clock adjustments that we see here. So um, there may not be a relation there. So most of these errors uh, about the corrupted logs, or all of them, occur on um, instruments D806 and D906. Um, so I, I wonder what instructions are given to the operators regarding the message that they get. If, if I, I don't think I gave you uh, enough from the audit log to show you, but there appears to be a um, user action to respond to a, a dialogue question about or, or notification about these uh, corrupted audit logs. So maybe they're a standard. Maybe this is a standard thing that happens. And there's a but what what procedure is it? Why? Um, what should really happen here? I don't know. So then, if you looked at the corrupted log slide with a list of a, about a dozen, about a dozen or so entries, you will see that there was a system error that uh, that occurred. And the event says, rename corrupted log file. And then it goes on to specify the, the name of what was renamed and what it was renamed to. 
So that's, uh, that's where the question goes. What is really going on with these renamed corrupted log files? So next we go to a clock adjustment slide. So we have inconsistent daylight savings time adjustment uh, 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 between the workstations. So you have the clock adjustment slide up. Okay, good. So two of the four workstations, so on Friday, March 8th, all um, at the end of the day, um, all workstations were shut down and you have the weekend going and there was no, no work being done on the weekend. On the following Monday, which is March 11th, you have uh, the first entry in two of the log files shows that the daylight savings time adjustment has been made. It doesn't say it was made by the Verity Central application. It just says that when you look at the UTC timestamp, you see the minus seven instead of the minus eight, so you know it's been made. But there is no entry in the log file saying that uh, a user made this change. The other two workstations did not make an adjustment for daylight savings time. Um, one of the workstations, I think it was D706, later reversed from daylight savings time to standard time. And this appears to be due to a, uh, an intentional user action to, to change the time. But that would be something for investigation. I don't know for sure. So we have an unexpected frequency and magnitude of these clock adjustments. Between four workstations, we have 20 audit log entries for clock adjustments. So if you take the two um, time adjustments that were made um, that are not shown in the log, we have a total of 22 uh, clock adjustments made. One of the workstations had eight uh, clock adjustment entries in the log file. The others had three, four, and five. So the magnitude of these clock adjustments is also interesting. Some of the, some of the workstations, their first clock adjustment is a minus one hour. So in terms of daylight savings time where we spring ahead, we sprang back. So that was also interesting. Um, then we had... Um, some, so there were uh, four clock adjustments of large magnitude. One, which was 12 hours forward, followed uh, not too long later by an adjustment of 24 hours forward. That's strange. Uh, the other workstation, D706, had a clock adjustment of 24 hours backward, followed uh, in a little while later by a clock adjustment of 24 hours forward. So you can see that in, in the, in, I believe that's attached here. Um, so then we also have, so inconsistent timestamp and event information. I'll show you later where we have uh, an audit log entry with a, a, a destination time of say 356 and, uh, minutes and seven seconds and then the next log entry is prior to that time. So that is uh, an interesting um, anomaly here. We also have orphaned audit entries. So if you uh, consider the, the changes like the 24 hour reverse uh, time change that was made, that will take you, um, so if you look at the entries before that, oh, we'll get to them, we'll get to them in a second. Um, but, the, but it looks like the, if you look at the, consider the clock adjustment um, event in the audit log, it was made at a time that appears to be following um, several event entries that it is now precedes. So a statement that occurs here following these statements now actually occurs there in the, in, in the audit log. And you only guess it was, it was below those other entries because of the, uh, the or original timestamp in the audit log entry. So we have symmetric clock adjustments too. And I'm inclined to believe this is coincidence, but um, I'll be looking over my shoulder anyway. So one of the 24-hour clock adjustments was made at 2.34 a.m., so two hours and 34 minutes after midnight. And the reverse clock adjustment that goes forward was made at 9.26 p.m., which is two hours and 34 minutes before midnight. Again, it could be a coincidence. We don't know. So we have the, the let's see, here's the, 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 let's see if that was, okay, so let's go to the clock adjustment post daylight savings time. I've already mentioned that we had 20 clock adjustments across the four workstations, um, not counting the two that were um, seemingly involuntary. Um, 
all these all the other clock adjustments were made after the official transition uh, to the daylight savings time. I question: Were any of these adjustments actually necessary? And you know, what's what's the procedure here? And with it, we have some inconsistency in in what was done on the workstation. So something was either not followed exactly, or you know, mistake, or whatever happened. So then, if you look at at the the list of audit entries called post DST. And you have a red highlight on line 342461. So that's the clock update. And then before the change was March 11th at 1026 p.m. After it was March 11th at 925 p.m. So that is where we go back from. In this case, we're going from standard time to daylight savings time. So that could be a good thing. Then the green line following that, you have a clock update before change of March 13th at 2.34 a.m. Then afterwards, you're at March 12th at 2.34 a.m. So for whatever reason, early in the morning, we move back a day. And down below that, a few lines in red, you see a clock update before change um, of at 9.26 p.m. on March 11th. And then after change, it's 9.25 p.m. on March 12th. And it's interesting that this time, this timestamp here is um, the original time is March 11th at 9.26 p.m., yet it follows a previous change that is um, original time of March 13th. So your audit log is out of order. And so then so we need to go. Excuse me a second. So yes, the, the question that comes up again is, I've asked already, is how, what, what made it necessary for all these different massive adjustments to be made and all the, the, the large number of timestamps to be, to be made? So um, now here, if you look at the clock details, there's a, a little confusion here. And it is because I was looking in my spreadsheet and put line 43 when it's actually. Um, so line 43, if you look at the row that starts with 342540, that will be on the next line, next sheet that says clock details. It's the big one, the messy one. So down about 342543. Uh, let's see, 342543. Line 43. So, anyhow, what I have there, yeah, 342540. Okay, so that's near the bottom of the clock details, the, the second grouping just above the bottom. So, then you'll see what we have is the original time is earlier than the prior two clock updates. So, in that line, 342540, you have the clock update before change is March 11th, 2024, at 1026 p.m. The previous two entries in this little snippet that you see there, um, their timestamp is March 12th in both cases. So again, you have out of order in your audit log. Then if you go to the second page of clock details, this was something that was a little bit difficult to catch. If you um, look at the 322025, it's in the second grouping on the clock details, do you find that? What number? So it's, it's line, it's row number 322025. It's in the second grouping of clock details, yeah. the second of three. So the timestamp is March 11th at 949 um, a.m., that's okay. And then the destination time is March 11th at 949.05 a.m. What you see in the next line after that the original time is listed at 9.49 and zero seconds. So you have a line following one line where the original time is supposed to be prior to the destination time on the, pri on the previous line. And that is also confusing because what you will find is that in every case that I've examined, and I think I've examined every one of them, the clock adjustments and always the destination time is equivalent to the timestamp on the audit log entry. So that's why this is particularly confusing. You have one entry that says 
we, 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 we are at 9.49.05. The next entry said, we're moving, we're adjusting the time from 9.49.00, which is before the previous one. Confusing. I'd like to ask, ask okay. a clarifying question. Um, so I'm on the clock details page. Yes. Okay. And is this sorted by date time, or is this sorted by row? Okay, so the audit log is sorted by, they, they look to be consistent. They date, the timestamp and the row are the same. I don't believe they should be. I think that if you have four workstations and they might be off a, a few minutes in, in some case, they might be legitimately off, then you would want in the audit log to have the first entry that you get from one of those machines to be the order in which it was received by Verity Central. Correct, yeah. And so, so I, would, I'm, I was surprised. Initially when I looked at the audit log, I, I believed that the row number was the order of receipt and not exactly matching the, the timestamp. But in everything I've seen, they, they do match exactly. Now, Excel doesn't like UTC time format, and I have not spent the time to, um, to correct that, but there's more research to be done there. So there's a lot of time and effort that went into this analysis, and um, I'm not finished yet, but there are some things that I have questions for myself. I have to resolve some, some, my own questions here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so then we go to the orphaned entries. So what you'll find... This is what I was talking about earlier. So orphan entries. So if you look at the second set there, what you see like in, um, rows 347, 137 to 347, 143. Those, um, you look at the timestamps, those are from 2.32 and 19 seconds in the morning on March 13th, and to 2.34 and 22 seconds, also on March 13th. So we have a sequence of events. Someone or something is operating the workstation. And then you look back at the first row on that page, 3.42.472, and what you see is that before the change, we had, we're at 3.13.224, 2024, at 2.34.24 a.m. So by all, um, Figuring that I can do, it looks like the 342472 actually occurred after 342143, 347143. So if you look at the first line on that sheet, that is a clock adjustment um, event. And what happened is the change was uh, the before change, the original time is at 313 at 234 a.m., which is just following the line three, four, row 347143. So now what you have is what appears to be an event at this location, down this far in the log. It has been moved up above the things that actually preceded it. So uh, how am I doing for time? I'm... Keep going. Okay, all right. So what I have here is a, so on to the next slide now, uh, these clock adjustment concerns. So I have a loss of confidence in the audit log event order. Um, if I'm trying to re recreate what happened on those workstations and at Verity Central, I don't know how to do it. The V-Drive write that occurs on March 13th at 1.56 a.m. was for 1,147 1, ballots. This is a resume of what I already, I already told you. We have a substantial amount of activity, about 6,700 log entries, that occur between the time of 9 p.m. and 3.30 a.m. between March 11th and March 13th. So um, when do those, those events actually occur? You have a, this is a, a meaningful percentage of your log file is really questionable. So are these, um, are there legitimate reasons for this? I hope so. Was it carelessness? Well, we can be forgiving, maybe. <laughs> hard to be forgiving when you have to do it on behalf of, you know, of all your constituents. Was it a cybersecurity intrusion? We don't know. So what I think we have, um, up to three heart audit log bugs. And um, that's, that's concerning. We have um, critical infrastructure. Our elections are critical infrastructure. And this is what we have running our critical infrastructure. I don't like that. So um, I have brought up the Mesa connection here. So what triggered the Mesa County activity? So if you know 
I'm assuming you've heard the Mesa County story that we, you have you, ha you have a, these a second a series of tables in the database that opened up. So it looks like there is a processing going on, and then some of the ballots that were initially processed get transferred to the new database. The system continues running from the new database, and some of what was in the original tables gets forgotten. And so it, you, the question is, what made that start? Was it a, a, an external uh, signal that you had cyber, cyber attack? Was it something that was already running on the system? Was there some, some, something written into the code that triggered something when a certain number of ballots had been processed? I don't know. So it could have been a time change. So that's uh, what, we, what we're talking about here is a lot of time changes. Um, many other triggers are possible to generate that sort of activity. One clue in the Mesa County uh, showed impossibly rapid scan times after the second set of tables were created. So it seems like there was digital copying of ballot images, which um, what you really want is you want the scanners to be um, creating the images themselves, and that takes time. And um, so we also, uh, I did look a little bit into that, and I looked into that somewhat uh, since, since the formation of, of the, this, um, the, this uh, these, these pages, um, there were some interesting scan times that, uh, that I saw. I don't know uh, your scanners that well, so I don't know what, is a, what should be expected of them or what sort of range of, of scan times for a batch you would, be, you would see. I saw what was common was about a minute and 20 seconds to a minute and 40 seconds for, uh, for a batch of, uh, say, 100. I found in the logic and accuracy test some, uh, some um, uh, batches were scanned in a matter of three or four or five seconds which is questionable, what, what's going on there. Um, it's, it's an LAT, so um, maybe there's some special behavior, special tests they have. But also on that one batch of 100 that was written to vDrive that was never counted, that batch of 100 had a, had a, um, a process time of 20 seconds as opposed to the typical um, minute and 20 to minute and 40. So there's, there's reasons to, to, to speculate here. So I think the uncounted V drive requires explanation. I think that's the most likely that would have a legitimate one. I don't know. And we have the three heart, potential heart bugs. And we have um, the elections being critical infrastructure. Um, why do we have bugs like this? So do we have carelessness or um, lack of procedures? Or is there something else the nasty going on? And the two workstations that self-updated to Pacific time, two did not. What is that? A, that's a different in, difference in configuration, which is probably not what you wanted. And you have the extensive post-daylight savings time um, transition activity late at night or early morning. So, sorry for running through that, too, for speaking too fast, but um, any questions? Have you run any of this by our election uh, office to get these questions answered? I have not. I was hoping that you that you would do that, actually, because I... I mean, wouldn't that be helpful? Uh, it would be helpful. Because they obviously are very familiar with this, mm -hmm. and, you know, all of us, we're just lay people out here. Okay. So, I mean, this is uh, way over our heads. I, I don't think anybody uh, would understand any of this that you just presented. It sounds like a... A whole lot of who shot John, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, you you understand that there can be discrepancies, you know, in in the logs for various reasons. It could be human error. Uh, do you also understand that this Heart InterCivic voting system is new to our county? That it's only the second time that it's been used, and I do. Yes. there's a learning curve. And you know, we had a perfectly functioning Dominion voting system that worked for very beautifully for decades and all of a sudden they, you know, our board decided to get rid of it because they believed that the machines were rigged. Mm -hmm. And you, you do understand the air gap. There is an air gap. There is an air gap, but yes. there are probably, it's been found throughout the, the nation. That no, a lot, let's talk a lot about California. Okay. Let's talk about Shasta County. Okay. Let's not talk about what happened in other well, states. Well, I'd like, we'd like to hear what he yeah. was going to Go say. Ahead. What were you going to say? So there are um, documented cases in, in, in a number of other states where you have um, clear evidence that there was uh, you have entries in the log files where there was um, internet, you know, uh, internet, internet access. You have the, the IP addresses and such. 
do you, I mean, so, but you, you understand that California has different election laws than those other states. I we have our own state. I do understand that, yes. Okay. So what they I do also, in other states doesn't necessarily apply. It doesn't necessarily, but it may. Yeah. Because in, in these other states, people didn't know that they, they had, um, uh, they had uh, communications devices on the machines before either. And so we think they're not here, but they didn't think they were there either, and they found them. ESNS shipped thousands, and of course you don't use ESNS, but they shipped thousands of devices that had uh, internet connectivity. So if you have, uh, and like in the, in the Mesa County, they, they found 30 some um, communications devices on in their EMS. But that's, that's in Colorado. That's in Colorado, yes. So, which, so which, you believe in the Mesa pattern of fraud? I, I know what happened. I know there's evidence there. I know, I know the story pretty well, yes. Okay. Were you paid to come here today? <laughs> no, I wasn't. You were? Okay. Uh, did you testify in the Laura Hobbs trial? I did. And what did the judge say about your testimony? The documents on which I based my testimony were not admissible because they apparently hadn't been um, um, authenticated to the court. Uh -huh. So. And did the judge, Stephen Baker, ask uh, Laura Hobbs' attorney, Alex Haberbush, during the trial, why your opinion as a witness he, he's not regarding on trial here. this is ridiculous uh, I'm, I'm just we're, asking we're, a question yeah, I know. should, should carry we're, more weight we're than talking the paper about boy down the no, I'd like to defer to county council because we have an agenda item and we need to keep it to the agenda item correct ultimately if you want to ask questions about the presentation that's appropriate right thank you right but Laura Hobbs court case has nothing to do with the presentation, He correct? He was at the Laura Hobbs trial. He, anyway, he, 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 please speak he, to this. He presented this evidence at a trial and it was uh, thrown out. I do not, I was in the courtroom. I do not believe that he presented he just this said he testified. evidence. I did he didn't okay. testify. May I say? Yes. So I was uh, on the stand for about 30 minutes maybe, and that included uh, haggling over whether I was an election expert or not. Um, I did not have all this information at that time, and so m most of it was just a matter of uh, tell, tell us a few things and they'll, we'll, be, we'll be done with it. So much of what I've presented here was not in the trial. But is there a reason why you haven't gone to the election office and, and confronted them with this information and asked them to explain it to you? I mean, it, I mean you've, been in, you've been in the county. I, a no, of times. so I, w I was, I testified from home. It was via WebEx. I was not there in person. Okay. So, so this is your first time here? Um, to, I've, I've been through Reading many times, yes. But I mean, as far as? As far as this goes, yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Anything else? Anybody else have any other questions? I might have, I might have some more after I hear Go, go ahead, Margaret. I have a question here. Oh, yes. actually, she's in the queue here. Margaret. Okay. Thank you for coming today. Um, this is very interesting information. I'm quite interested in the um, that someone was operating at their workstation uh, early in the morning. Mm -hmm. And that bothers me a little bit because nobody's supposed to be doing anything. I did pull up the election laws and, and the different things that are going on. Mm -hmm. And they say that when you do your processing, you are not supposed to be, um, you know, diving into a, a machine. I'm curious as to why they can access their workstations at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, I think what, your, what the previous questioner asked was about uh, the heart being a new system and, and there's being a learning curve. That could explain some of this. Okay. So it might have been 2.34 a.m. in the morning. It might have been 2.34 p.m. at some point. So um, that, that's, that would need some explanation. Thanks for clarifying that. I want to thank you also for the information today. Um, I and I, I do agree that it would be helpful for our election office and any staff, um, certainly our ROV, to hear what you yes. have to say. Is there another opportunity today that they may come and hear you speak at a uh, location? Yes, I'm going to be speaking at uh, the library tonight at, from 5.30 to maybe 7.30. Okay. And so uh, you're welcome to come. Great. 
and anyone else. It's open to the public. It is open to the public. Thank you. Because I am concerned about what I did see here, the 6,700 log entries between 9 p.m. and 3.30 a.m. Have you seen this in other counties? I mean, is this common? I looked at um, Nevada County, and I did not see this, mm -hmm. but I have not looked at enough other counties to, to know sure. to see. So. Okay. It is, it is alarming. It's, a, it's a, lot of, a lot of effort to, to look at, look at the, this. this uh, yeah. So I, I look at what I can, and um, uh, we will go with that. So We appreciate your contribution today. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Oops, oh, that's right. Sorry about that. If I understood your last response, that there may be very reasonable answers to all your questions. Um, there may be reasonable answers to some of them. Um, others of them look like they are genuine heart bugs. So, what? genuine heart intercivic bugs in their audit log. So, if you see um, one um, log entry that, by all reasoning, seems to be out of place, like it shows up before where you think it should be, that is probably not uh, a user error. If you see the, those, one, those cases where we had five seconds or seven seconds difference in timestamps, so something, at, you have a time at um, zero seconds after the, after the minute, and a previous entry was already five or seven seconds after the minute, that's not an operator error. That looks like a, it's not something uh, is maybe a bug there. In a newly installed system. In, well, in a newly installed system, yeah. Which, which they're not. Um, this, this sort of bug would not be, um, I, I don't think it would be a, a, an aspect of a new or, or seasoned system. Uh, the, the training issues might be a matter of being a new, new or seasoned system, but these sorts of bugs, the, that the code would operate the same way, whether it's first time or tenth time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Can I go ahead and uh, ask a couple more okay. questions? Sure. So you understand that you know this was a new system and it was they only had a few months before the first election to learn everything about this new system uh, they've been using another system for decades mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden and you know and we actually didn't even have a voting system in the county mm -hmm. for a number of months mm -hmm. uh, and it was you know we were trying to go to hand counting yes. um, and do you you know speaking of hand counting do you believe hand counting is more accurate and more uh, faster, more accurate and trustworthy than a machine tabulator. Or well, well, so we're getting off of what the presentation <laughs> yeah. was. Uh, yeah. Hand counting is not an issue yeah. before the commission. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I will mention one to one of your questions. I think was was relevant to the presentation. Um, so if there are legitimate explanations to these findings, then it will be comforting. So that's. That would be a good thing if we have legitimate explanations. So if uh, your ROV can come tonight and, and I can talk with her, that would be good. So you're not saying that there's any massive voter fraud or the system's rigged or there are nefarious actors that are trying to interfere in our local elections? Is that a, is that a valid statement? Well, you have had Dr. Frank speaking here a number of times, right? Uh, I've never listened to him. Oh, well, that would be, I would think that would be a good thing. So. Um, so he, he can, he would, well, I can, I can, I will cover some of what he's said in my talk tonight, so that would be a, a good time. I have, I have no other questions. I did have a question and I lost it. I'm just, give me two seconds so I can try to remember. It had to do, oh, I have observed the, the functioning of these machines, and so when somebody is using the workstation or the machine or whatever you want to call it that is creating this log, so everything that's done on this machine creates an entry in the log, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'm assuming there are you know, some things that they can press, some buttons they can press on the screen or the keyboard that, for instance, can change time, right? I mean, they have some options. There's got to be a menu, right? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, so if, you know, so if we assume that they weren't familiar with the machines, they, they did do one small election in November prior to the March election, uh, and they used the machines. So theoretically, they used them, sort of got up to speed on them somewhat. But the general 
choices for the machine, I would think would be pretty simple. You scan the ballot in, that's going to register in the log. Mm -hmm. You, it comes up, you know, it either looks good or it goes to adjudication mm -hmm. and then there's an entry in the log. Um, you know, I mean, the people operating the machines have to look at the options and they press the button, you know, and then they look at the adjudication and they press the button, it's good or it's not good or, you know, whatever. But the person doing this, and this is all goes theoretically in order, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So all these tasks on the machine go in order. So what I hear... Uh, you saying is that you know there's some things that you mentioned that could be explained by lack of operator training possibly mm -hmm. um, but there are some things that make no sense that's true yes okay and some things that make no sense when the machine logs everything that happens with that machine yeah. theoretically in order mm -hmm. they shouldn't be they shouldn't be jumbled around no. right yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'll make one correction is that um, I've uh, worked on a system where we were developing a device for medical systems and we had to create an audit log for them. And um, during development, you would be, you'd be testing your, your code and you would, you would look at the audit log to make sure that the things that should be in there were not. So it is possible to, for a developer to say, to make a mistake and not remember to um, audit something. To, to call the code to enter the event in the audit log, but that would be a consistent event for that, for for that for all of the for, for everything. Machines. Yes. Right, and and I know you probably can't speak to this, but I'm assuming. I mean, the heart machines have been around; mm -hmm. people have been using them. Mm -hmm. So the software. I mean, I'm sure they do software updates periodically, but but I mean, the software has been established. It's not like this was a new system. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So. I, I, I think this would show up um, somewhere else as, as well, some of these things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I will m mention one more thing. As far as looking at the overall picture of uh, our elections, the more evidence you look at, the better. So that's, that's my, my, my advice. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Do you you have can, sure. <laughs> can the RV or ROV know who accessed the audit logs? Do okay, they have that information? They would have that information. So my copy had that redacted, right. so the, the ROV would, would be able to know, know that. And then the question is, um, let's look at the, let's say the early morning uh, entries, for example. Um, was that person whose initials or whose uh, ID is listed in the audit log the person who did it, or did someone um, man manage to get their ID? So that's another question. Right. It may not be the person whose ID is there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um.